Hello, everyone, and welcome to Uncorked History. I am Kelly Pollack, and uh, it is very dark in Chicago. I was just remarking that it feels like it's midnight at this point, <laughs> even though it's 7 p.m. here. Uh, so if we all fall asleep, that's why. Uh, no, just kidding. I'm going to turn it over to Jamie. Uh, so hi, Jamie. Hi. How's everyone doing? Doing great. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Good. Well, we have two very special guests tonight, and I'll introduce both of them, and then we will just dive straight into some questions. Um, first, we have Dr. Rebecca Simon. You have seen her on the History Channel, BBC, and I think most recently Netflix's Lost Pirate Kingdom, which was very exciting. Um, her research, uh, at least her doctoral research, focused on pi public pirate executions, which all right. <laughs> um, she is the author of Why We Love Pirates, The Hunt for Captain Kit and How He Changed Piracy Forever. And she has a forthcoming work on Anne, Bonnie, and Mary Reed, which I am very excited about. We also have Krishan Lampley. Uh, she is a negotiant, uh, a wine enthusiast, and founder of LCS Entertainment, LLC, which features love corkscrew wines. Uh, I was so hoping to find that near me and I, I could not find it. Um, but LCS is a lifestyle brand. It launched six wine varietals in 2013. And uh, Krishan has over 14 years of experience in the industry. So welcome to both of you. Thank you. Thank uh, you. So we usually start with, what are you drinking? So I'm going to say, I'm drinking Love Corkscrew. <laughs> I love uh, it. <laughs> so this is, uh, oh gosh, I was going to remember, I put the bottles over in another. Um, it looks like come it's the sweet or the dry. It's either we go sweet. high or hard knock life. Hard knock, hard knock life. life. It's hard knock life. Yes. And I also <laughs> have not had dinner and I'm having two glasses of wine because I also have to drink a white, right? Love uh, it. And this is Touch the Sky. Love, oh, so too sweet. So you decided to do the two sweets. Yes. Yep. Yep. Great. Indeed. Great. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Thank you. Uh, so I, of course, we discovered before we started that uh, <laughs> Krishan and I live like five minutes away from each other. So no surprise that I can find this in pretty much every store around me. <laughs> Literally love Corkscrew Nation in the Hyde Park area in Chicago. Yes, Absolutely. Indeed. Very love easy. <laughs> <laughs> Jamie, what area are you in? Uh, I live in uh, Alexandria, Virginia, so I'm outside of DC. Um, uh, Virginia, I yes, looked I on I looked online, and I was like, I would have to have it shipped to me. And I yes, was like, yes, not yes, enough time. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> Hopefully <laughs> soon. Hopefully one day soon. <laughs> yes, for sure. I'm gonna order some because I really want to try some. Yeah, I was I looking for it as well. Code for you. <laughs> I was looking for it as well, and they do carry. I'm in LA. They do carry it here at like Total Wines, but the nearest yes, one yes. is about. 40 minutes away and I didn't have time, unfortunately, but, I'm, but now I know where it is. Well, I will have to be the, the drinker for all of you and tell you how wonderful it is. And then you'll have to go make that drive. Yes, Thank I you. want to. Thank you. I will. Enjoy. Thank you so much. Well, so Jamie, I, are you drinking something? I, well, I'm not, well, I am, but not alcohol. Um, <laughs> I'm flying very early tomorrow to go visit my grandparents. And so I have espresso with some uh, pumpkin spice creamer in it. Um, espresso at 8 p.m., probably not the best idea, but we're gonna go with it. <laughs> we're gonna do it. Not any worse idea than me drinking two wines at the same time, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's Rebecca, are you, are you drinking anything tonight? Yes, I'm drinking um, from Josh Sellers, uh, a Chardonnay. Very nice. I love Josh Sellers. Oh God, me too. I love him so much. <laughs> And Krishon, are you drinking your own? <laughs> Actually, no. So, so my my own supply, as they say. <laughs> I here. see it. It's very nice. But I am drinking water, and it says there's a chance there's wine. <laughs> <laughs> if so. that is full of wine, you're going to be on the floor. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> uh, so we normally save the questions from the audience until later, but this is Jermaine. Uh, my mom asks if your wine is available in Ohio. Yes, it is. It's all over Ohio, uh, in Myers, uh, in Cost Plus World Market, uh, several small boutiques. So absolutely is. Uh, if she can go on the website, lovecorkscrew.com, she should be able to put in her zip code, but 100% Myers. I'm on the shelf of every single Myers there. 
Uh, well, and I the know... drier wines. Oh, she likes drier wines. It's my drier does, ones on does, Meyer's yes. shelf. Great. Very yes. good. My Very Cabernet good. Yep. Uh, certainly the uh, world market is a, a popular destination for wine tasting. Yes. So uh, mom, go to world market. <laughs> please, please. <laughs> Well, maybe I can start us off. I, I have a question for Krishan, uh, and probably because I'm a, a noob when it comes to wine, but what is a negotiant? <laughs> what, what exactly does that mean? Yes, so it's pronounced negotiant. Okay. So a negotiant <laughs> uh, is definitely a form, the easiest uh, way to say it's a form of a winemaker, um, but it's in different stages. So uh, where I start the process is I source from the different vineyards. So I don't own my own vineyard. So mm -hmm. I source from different vineyards and wineries. Um, I've been in industry actually 25 years now. Mm -hmm. um, I've owned Love Corks for nine years um, and I've sourced from four different vineyards. Uh, I'm currently sourcing um, from a vineyard in Chile, which is very exciting for me, uh, for a Sauvignon Blanc, um, California. And I love to support local. So actually Kelly is drinking um, two of my locally sourced uh, Michigan wines um, that are really, really uh, true to the Midwest in Niagara and Concord, um, which is definitely in New York area, of course, Niagara, New York. Um, so they're just great grapes for, for the Midwest. So that is what a negocion is. I produce it. So starting from the time it, it's harvest, um, I work directly uh, with the vineyards and I do everything to make the product my own, whether it be the residual sugar, whether it be the acidity, all of it's me. So uh, it's I've been doing it a long time. It's great. And that's probably the only reason we could get you in November. There are some other uh, people who have their own vineyards tend to be pretty busy right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, funny. So I was telling you earlier, I, I have literally an hour of sleep because um, it's it's O and D season, as they call in my, in, uh, my industry, October, November, December. So we are the busiest during this time, not only harvest, but this is the main time that we actually make money because everyone buys wine during the time. Summertime is spirits. Mm -hmm. wine is yeah. is the holidays so our largest season happens to, uh, starting thanksgiving so we prep in october obviously from harvest as well um but all the store shelves are going crazy so we're trying to make the small little time that we actually make money we do it in these three months <laughs> so yes busy season <laughs> excellent uh so rebecca i have a question for you mm -hmm. which is why do we love pirates? <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh, so many reasons. Um, so yeah, this was a big question. I, I actually had started to develop when I was doing my master's because I was like, after reading Bredeker's book, Villains of All Nations, where he talks about, yeah, Jamie's nodding her head. She knows what's up. Um, uh, after reading that book, I was like, okay, so pirates were seen as terrorists and treated as terrorists. How'd we get from that to Jack Sparrow? So how'd that change? So um, based on my research, my arguments is, and what I believe is that I think there's always been this fascination with pirates because people have always just been kind of drawn to, you know, um, so I'm trying to think of the word, kind of the people who go against society. We've always been very fascinated by that. But what was interesting about pirates in the 1700s in particular is that they were able in a way to escape or transcend their social classes, which was pretty much unheard of during the early modern period. And this is because a lot of pirates who were working class and not all were, a lot were actually middle and even upper classes, depending on what their origins were. They were able to, if they survived piracy, they could get wealthy and be able to retire in just a year or two, again, if they were lucky. Um, so that was quite fascinating. And also people were interested in piracy because they were people a lot, they were people that many others didn't really have much of a personal connection to. They're reading about these figures who are sailing in exotic locales, going against the man and, you know, kind of wreaking havoc. And this is just really interesting. And then this was fueled by the publication of a general history of the pirates in 1724. And, you know, still in print bestseller pirate biographies that are mostly fictionalized, like fact, and every hole is filled in with a lot of fiction to make it a bestseller and some's entirely fictional, but it was really the book Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson when it was published in 1883 that really kind of changed the perception of pirates and made people really start to love them. Um, Cause you know, he kind of creates this great anti-hero, the hunt for buried treasure and coming up with a lot of the kind of archetypes and tropes of piracy, you know, the R matey, which was the accent of which was popularized by Robert Newton in the 1950s version of Treasure Island. And this is kind of what set off kind of this very romantic idea of like this anti-hero and Long John Silver finding this buried treasure and you're kind of rooting for the villain, even though he is a villain. And this just 
kind of transcended through the 20th century. It's one of the most adapted pieces of literature of all time. And yeah, so lots of reasons. I can ramble on for ages, but I don't want to take up too much time on it. So, but many, many reasons. I love, I love this, uh, the tropes that come from Robert Louis Stevenson's Treasure Island, because it's just like, it proliferated through all different types of pop culture. It wasn't just in literature, but it was in film and it was, you know, all of these things. So I, I think that's really fascinating. Um, something that's really interesting to me is how people get started in their industries or in their fields. And so we'll start with Krishan, like what drew you to entering the wine industry? people. And um, I was in sales and marketing for over 25 years. Um, and I just was always drawn to people. I go back as a child. I was a classical trained pianist. I was always in front of theater. Um, just, I loved people. I'm more comfortable in front of thousands than I am in, in front of one. So it was that I want to get to, get to know you and I want to talk about it. I, I want to talk to everyone. Um, and then it, it kind of transcended into owning an art gallery. And when I own the art gallery, um, I actually wrote the wine list and we won Chicago's best uh, for the best wine list. So I, I knew I had the knack for it. So the quick story um, is a start in sales and marketing grew in the wine industry through distribution side as well. So um, I was in the sales side, had over 250 accounts and I knew what was missing because everyone would tell me the same thing. They want to support small batch vineyards and wineries. They were sick of people like me coming in, selling them the kettle one, smearing off and some crappy wine, uh, you know, because that was part of our sales goal. So it it really was listening to people um, and enjoying what wine brings. It, it's enjoyment over breaking bread with, with each other and that conversation that you have. And it's interesting. Uh, and just uh, that's the quick of it. Uh, and a million bottles sold thus far. I love Corkscrew. So cool. That's amazing. I, I'm the opposite. I am comfortable in front of like five people. And then like, you get me in front of thousands and I'm like, so hello. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny. I, so I did, it was great. I actually, so I did a TEDx and it was funny beforehand, you know, I'm nervous. I want to throw up and just, you know, I don't know what's going on. And I'm like, oh my God, I've been practicing. And you know, it's been, they're very, very strict on exactly what you have to do. And, and how you have to do it and where you have to stand on the red dot and all this thing. And it was so funny, as soon as I hit the stage and this huge audience of people, I'm like, I'm home. Like, it was great. Beforehand, uh, people wanted to talk to me. I'm like, leave me alone. <laughs> like, I want to <laughs> talk now. This is going to change my life. And when I get on stage, I was fine. So, you know, wine is romance. Uh, wine is selling it. There's thousands of wine brands out there, but it's about telling your story. Um, mm -hmm. And I love Cork True tells a story. That's awesome. Thank you. Uh, so Rebecca, how'd you, so uh, we both do pirate stuff. So how did you get into pirate stuff? So kind of in two ways, really. So um, kind of the, in, in the non-academic way, I'm from Los Angeles, born and raised, and my mom would take us to Disneyland every single year from the time I was a baby, really. And my favorite ride was just always Pirates of the Caribbean. I don't know why, I think I just liked the music and it was just kind of fun to see the graphics. And I've always just really loved swimming and the beach and stuff like that. So a little cliche, but I just really love the ride. And then in 2003, Pirates of the Caribbean, The Curse of the Black Pearl came out and I was a big Johnny Depp fan, still am. Um, I thought the movie looked really cool, went and saw it with my friends and I saw it like three times in theaters. I thought it was so fun. But that was for a long time, that was just kind of it. I was like, oh, this is fun, but I never thought I'd do something with it. And then when I started my master's in history, I really wished that there was a way I could have combined like colonial American history and early modern British history and all that. And then we had a professor who was new develop this field called it, or he didn't develop it, but he brought in the field of Atlantic history. He'd actually been a student of Marcus Redeker at uh, University of Pittsburgh. And we read the book Villains of All Nations, and I thought that was just so fascinating. Um, again, like, you know, pirates that were treated as terrorists, you know, this war on pirates, not too different from the war on terror, in my opinion, in some ways. And again, like I said before, I was like, how did we get from there to Jack Sparrow? And I wanted to start researching it further. It's honestly something that I never thought I'd get into. If you'd asked me when I started my master's program, like, would you ever do maritime history? I would have been like, no. Um, and I ended up absolutely loving it. And I didn't even think it was a subject I could do. Like what historian would do piracy? I thought it was just Marcus Redeker's thing until I did an independent study and had to read all this literature on it. And when I went to do my doctorate, 
um, at King's College London, I wanted to continue with perceptions of piracy because that's what I looked at for my master's. My master's was on Treasure Island and um, portrayals of pirate in print in the 17th, 18th and 19th centuries. And I, my supervisor there, um, he was like, you got to narrow the topic and it took me a while to really develop it. And I was reading the book, um, Captain Kidd and the War Against the Pirates. And I saw he was being taken to execution dock in Wapping, East London to be executed for piracy. And I was like, that's interesting. I thought everyone went to the Tyburn tree in West London. I want to find a book about why public executions for pirates were different and nothing had been written about it at all. And so that became my topic. And took me down this rabbit hole of so much, you know, colonization, um, legal history, another subject, I would have always said no, if you asked if I get into it, I actually loved it so much, I thought about law school for a minute. Um, and yeah, and just kind of really consumed me and I absolutely love it. Keep studying it forever, I swear. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. So uh, Chris Schoen, a lot of uh, the sort of the stereotype of what we think of when we think about people in the wine industry is like they're in California and they're white men. So, you know, obviously there, it, there's not a lot of women of color in the wine industry. Uh, and there's probably not that many Midwesterners for that matter. So can you talk some about that piece of it? You know, how how you make your way in this industry um, that isn't used to people like you uh, and, and what that means to to be the person who's bringing that change to the industry? Yeah, it, it's, it's complicated. It's a struggle each day. Um, I have to work 10 times harder just to be accepted. Um, so there's a total of, I'll give you the exact numbers, um, out of African women, African American women negociants, vineyard owners or winery owners, there's literally 60 of us out of 111,000 in the world. So 60 out of 111,000 in the world, yes, um, beyond a unicorn um, within this industry. Um, it's been an interesting fight, especially in the Midwest. So you're absolutely right. Not only that do I have against me, um, but the fact that I'm in the Midwest and not in California, you're like, huh? Um, but it's been awesome because I'm definitely a pioneer in the Midwest. Um, there is absolutely no Midwestern, definitely no Midwestern woman or African-American woman um, that has gone to stores um, and actually get into all the stores uh, with my wines uh, from Walmart to Target to Benny's to Mariano's to, to so many cost plus world markets. So it's been amazing. Uh, my motto is I, I definitely want to break glass ceilings till there's no more to be broken. And there's just um, a great time for uh, diversity and inclusion right now um, for many reasons that we don't, you have to be living under a rock not to know some of the reasons. Um, and it's it's been awesome because I'm able to, uh, to have a voice finally. Um, you can Google black women in wine and bloop, here's Krishan, you know? So it's, it's one of those things um, where I've enjoyed it. There's been um, some great programs, corporate directives to, to include wines. Um, and what's so really awesome is every, uh, all wines are different, you know, and are all subjective. And 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 it, it's it could be there's some amazing, amazing vineyards in the mid Midwest that people know nothing about. There's 50 in Illinois that people have never heard of. Um, so it, it's so much fun uh, to be able to uh, be a negotiant in this industry at this time. And 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 uh, definitely, uh, it's been great uh, being such a small sector and showing people that you can do anything. What are the ways that um, that being from the Midwest has uh, influenced you and in, in your approach to to wine and to sales? And you know, I, I'm a Midwesterner too, so I love the Midwest. But you know what? Uh, what are the ways that that has had an, an impact on you? More whimsical and fun, not so serious. Um, and like, let's break this down. It's a hundred and thirty billion dollar industry. When things are bad, people drink. When things are good, people drink. There's so many different sectors of it. So from what I heard just working in the industry for so long was not only supporting small batch, but a lot of people cannot pronounce Chianti and Chenin Blanc and Bordeaux and care to, don't care to. Doesn't mean they don't want to drink it. They get totally confused in a wine aisle and they're not sure exactly what they're picking up. Um, so as a Midwesterner, you know, definitely a Chicagoan, we're very straightforward, we're a little less serious, um, a little more fun. Um, and that's what I wanted to bring to the wine industry. And I think I've done that with my double entendres. And, and I think my labels speak to people. Um, Chicago is a very people city. 
you know, unlike New York, <laughs> even though I love New York, uh, where they, they always call us a cleaner, nicer New York, right? So I, I wanted it to be really, really fun, like my Pinot Grigio's, Good Times, Good Friends, and my Riesling's Head Over Heels. I wanted to speak to the consumer, and I, and I think the Midwest uh, has that, that love that I think I brought to the industry. That's awesome. I, you know, what I, I drink a lot of wine. I don't know that much about wine. And that's um, okay. <laughs> yeah. It's just something that I enjoy and, and buy a lot of, but it, you know, I never really thought about the Midwest when I was thinking about wine, you know, you think about France, you think about California, you think about Spain, like you think about all these major regions and now I want to go find more sort of unique areas for wine. I think that would be really exciting to like get into. That's um, why Washington's a big thing now um, with Riesling, like people love Washington Rieslings. So yes, there's so many different areas um, and regions and sectors of, of great, great growing that of course, each area, each weather condition, it's gonna taste different, have a different flavor profile uh, and it's fun. Is there anybody that, when you were breaking into the industry, especially, but like, is there anybody you looked up to or, or that you look up to now or somebody that inspires you in your industry? No. Uh, and, and I don't say that <laughs> in, in, in a negative way, but absolutely not um, be, because I wasn't in it, you know, like meaning there, there was no one here for me to look up to. I mean, if, if I want to go back far to like the Mandela sisters in, in Africa when they started, um, other than that, there was really no one to look up to. However, being in sales and marketing, I will say I really, really admired Bethany Frankel. I really admire what she did with Skinny Girl. Mm -hmm. um, it was, I, I'm a different scale of her story uh, as far as had a profession, new marketing, was standing in the grocery store. I remember some of the episodes when she's in the grocery store trying to sell it, right? That was me. I've elevated now. She, now she obviously has elevated extremely, um, but it's, it's really cool to, to see a small business and a personality and just someone who just has a love for something and, and uh, maybe a fun niche. It, it was really cool to see that. So I would say if anything, I, I really liked how she did it. Mind you, she was martinis and margaritas, but still um, just being a woman uh, in this hmm. wine and spirits industry, I would say she, her story was pretty cool how she did it. Very cool. Very cool. I mean, I think it's amazing that you've, you've made your own way and you found this niche and you're, you're doing it. You know what I'm saying? Like so many of us have these ideas and then we just, we just like, that's what they are. They stay ideas and, and you went with it. And I, I love that. I love Thank that. You. I just talked to somebody about that earlier today, how, you know, most small, 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 small businesses don't succeed. Um, and you, or there's some people with great ideas mm -hmm. and they don't execute it. Um, or they keep it just as a hobby. Right. No, turn that hobby into a business. Why not? You live one life. Uh, your heart's mm -hmm. beating for a reason. If it's something you want to do, I always say, never say I could have, would have, should have 80 years old. Just do it. Mm -hmm. What about you, Rebecca? Is there anybody that when you were entering into history or like going to grad school or, mm -hmm. or anything like that, like, is there somebody you looked up to? Um, a few. So I really got into history because, well, a lot of it is because of my grandparents. They were big travelers. And when I was little, I didn't travel very much. And then they decided that I needed to see the world. So um, I have a lot of family in Israel. I'm Jewish and like half my family is Israeli. And so they were going to go visit family when I was nine years old. So they took me and that just blew my mind because I'd never really been further away than the, the Sierras really. So it was absolutely fantastic. And it just really opened my mind. And I was already a fan of the Little House on the Prairie books when I was like six, you know, I didn't, I know they're problematic, but I didn't know that when I was six. And um, so I just got really into it. And I, all I wanted to do was learn about other cultures and other places and I used to call history back then when I was little and I just wanted to know how everything was different. And so my grandparents, you know, they really supported it. Um, my uncle was also, who's actually um, a big wino, part of all these wine clubs and stuff. So he's taught me a lot about wine growing up. Uh, so this is such a fun discussion. And uh, he was very supportive of me studying. He's like, you know, you know, you can never, he's like, just keep studying, keep traveling. And so I got a lot of support there. And then when I was doing my undergrad, um, there was a professor who I really liked, uh, Dr. Benjamin Klein. And I happened to take, I think every single class 
that he offered at University of San Francisco because he did a lot of early modern and um, colonization and that sort of stuff. Um, and we're still in touch to this day. I graduated in 2007 and we're still in touch and he's always been very supportive. And so he was really great. And um, yeah, like I'm trying to think, I know there's some others and oh my God, I'm like blanking. But my I, I loved all my professors when I was doing my master's degree. Um, I went to Cal State Northridge and the department was so great and all my professors were really awesome and they were very supportive. Uh, especially my supervisor, a man named Dr. Horowitz. Um, you know, he was really enthusiastic about my project. He's like, I know nothing about this, but I'm loving it. So he was just really, really encouraging. And But really when I moved to the UK, there was such a tight niche group of um, academics and historians. And I got involved in Twitter and really kind of met lots of historians through there. And I really feel like, honestly, it was like these online connections and these social connections I made when I was in the UK that really just helped keep me motivated. and helped kind of help me stay like really inspired. Like Jamie, I think we started following each other when we were both doing our doctorates at the same time, which is so cool. I was able to find other pirate historians and I made absolutely fantastic friends in my doctorate and lifelong friends and I couldn't have done it without them. So kind of lots of bits and pieces along the way, but it's really just the historical community that I've seen um, that I've met through Twitter and conferences and in the UK, trying to build that in California, but since I moved back, but I haven't been able to do that yet, partly because of the pandemic, but that's why I'm still grateful that there is such a deep community for it um, over places like Twitter and things like that. So it's really kind of everybody, everyone who's just so supportive and enthusiastic. Like I love giving back as much as I can as well. So apparently the reason I didn't finish my PhD is because Twitter wasn't around yet. <laughs> Oh my gosh. <laughs> okay. I would have finished if only Twitter had been around a few years earlier. I was going to say, I started Twitter the first year of my PhD and, and it's been like a wild ride ever <laughs> since. And I feel like oh, yeah. the community that I cultivated there was, was really helpful, especially because I didn't have a lot of help while I was in the program that I was in. Yeah. So having that outside community was really important. So God, I totally like... feel that. <laughs> oh, sorry. No, I was just going to say, like, I feel the same way because I had my friends in the PhD program, but my supervisor, great man, very hands off to the point where I wouldn't, there was a period of time I didn't see him for like eight months and I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> that I, sounds so first, familiar. <laughs> yeah. Like I was, you know, first generation academic in a way, actually my mom did a PhD starting the exact same time as me. So we were kind of adjacent first gen. So I had no idea what I was doing. Um, and Twitter was helpful. There was someone who put together a hashtag Twitter story and meetup. And I met so many cool people that way. And actually contacts that have actually stayed with me to this day. And it's helped me be able to do things like write for history today. And, you know, people from there were like, oh yeah, I remember you come on my podcast. It's just it's such a cool community. And yeah, sometimes I'm like, if it weren't for Twitter, God, who knows? <laughs> so it, it seems like academia is more on Twitter, but things like the wine industry, alcohol more generally is much more on Instagram. Is that what what you see as well? You know, and, and how I can make graphics, but I don't really understand how to use Instagram effectively. Like what are the sort of tricks? It, it seems like it's a great thing for things like a wine company to, to be on Instagram huge i cannot stress how huge it is for for product period uh there i've gotten over a half a million impressions alone on my social media all organic love corkscrew is hot on instagram and it's been amazing because that's how i sell bottles i mean it's, it's a call to action it's an easy way for the states that I'm at to say, hey, I'm at the Myers in Ohio, or, or hey, I'm in New York or Michigan. Or it's a great way to say. It. So I ran my, my own pages. Um, so I've been in business nine years and my own pages for eight and a half years. So literally the last six months, I relinquished control um, because the company's getting too big and I can't do it. What people love is authenticity. Um, they love a story. Um, for me, it's more about me than the brand, meaning they want to see what is Krishan Lampley or Miss Love Corkscrew or the wine lady, they call me, um, is doing and how I'm progressing. And that's important as opposed to some of the larger brands, a bottle and some fruit next to it. And it's a great shot. 
Um, so it has to be a nice mix. Um, definitely relinquishing and letting a, a marketing company control it um, has uh, definitely did this amazing um, gumbo pot of Krishan mixed with you know, the bottles mixed with the story, mixed with every great thing that's happening and all the press we're getting. Um, it's been a great thing. So I honestly can't imagine companies even thinking to start without having social media, way more than Facebook. Facebook does nothing for me like Instagram does. Um, TikTok does a little bit, but I, I cannot even stress it. Uh, one uh, great, great winemaker um, out of Healdsburg, California, um, I had a great conversation with him and he, he actually emailed me. I, I had flew down there, had a great talk, came back and he said in an email, Krishan, so how do you do it? Like this is like this huge multi-million dollar vineyard, right? <laughs> that sells this amazing 96 uh, point wine at $100 a bottle. And they're asking me how Love Corkscrew in Chicago sells so many bottles and has such a great organic following. Um, so it's definitely a, a trick to it. There's a gift to it, um, but it's all about being authentic and telling your story because we all can do that. Nobody's reinventing the wheel. We all can have a great product, but there's thousands of great products. We all can have a great service. There's a million great services, but it's only one you. So it's about telling your story. So you also do this, uh, this YouTube video uh, called Love Seat, uh, which is obviously very authentically you. Uh, and the the one I was watching, you were talking about uh, that you have to spend money to make money, which I, I think is extremely hard for people who don't like to spend money. Can you talk a little bit about that? And, and that sort of, you know, it, it feels so risky to do, you know, how, how you get over that. I hate it. I'm not over it yet. It's so hard. <laughs> I am so frugal, always have been. Um, and I think it's because I worked in high-end retail for so long. So I would see the richest of the rich buying the most ridiculous cash Gora jackets that I would sell them at $2,500 a pop. And I'm like, this is ridiculous. Um, so I've always been extremely frugal, but it came to the point that my business actually started scaling so high. I, I wasn't that startup any, anymore. I'm like, oh, wait a minute. I actually have employees now. Oh, wait a minute. I'm actually in multi-states now. So it wasn't like, let me hold on to every penny. It got to a point where my accountant's like, so you need to spend some money by the end of the year or <laughs> you're in trouble. <laughs> you know, we need to buy some things for the company or you're going to hit get hit really hard with taxes. I'm like, oh, wow, I'm there now. So it really became, okay, okay, instead of actually holding on to this pot, I actually have to, to take a chance. So when you're scaling, you actually have to, yes, spend more to make more. And my love seats um, are, we do one take. I've never re-recorded a love seat. It's literally my creative director, camera, me sitting in really my love seat in my condo, in my living room, and me just talking just letting it, you know, my hair down and like, hey, this is what I'm going through. And small businesses love it. Um, so yeah, it's hard. So yeah, I'm in that phase of spending money. It sucks, man. But I have to do it. Otherwise, I'm going to stay stagnant. I'm not going to grow. Um, and I'm, I'm looking to grow Love Quirks to a, to a huge level. So I got to do it. So here I go. <laughs> so that, it makes me think like, you know, we have all these preconceived notions about different jobs, different industries. And, you know, I, we, you know, we've talked to, you know, beer experts and stuff, and you just have this idea like, oh, it's all posh drinking wine and, and parties. And, and so what is something you wish people knew about your job or about your industry that you think that they get wrong? It's far from sexy and it's not a lot of money. Those are the two things. People think I'm literally just drinking wine all day, tasting wines, and then, oh, I'll just have somebody pack them and sell it. And you know, like, no, it's a lot of work. It's exhausting. You get kicked off the shelves nonstop, put on the shelves again. Um, there's, there's so many logistics and moving parts to it with, like, I just talked about this whole marketing side. I have a publicist and a marketing firm, and we have to really move on social media. But I also have to deal with 
five different distributors because there's different liquor laws in different states. It's not just one distributor. Then I'm like, oh yeah. And then there's the salespeople and then there's the trade developers. And then, you know, like it's, it's, it's like nonstop. Oh yeah, wait, the vineyards are calling saying, hey, Krishan, we're running low on Riesling. What are we going to do? So it's not sexy. Um, this industry and, and actually they're talking about in legislation, just it being this ugly three-tier system that has to end. It's out of control. Um, Cause we make the less, uh, the least out of everyone. By the time it gets to the shelf, I've made the least money. The distributors make the most money. Um, so it's, it's really, really uh, not what people think. You have to sell a lot of bottles. I, I mean, again, I've sold a million bottles and people are like, oh my God, you must be rich. A million bottles is nothing. When I get to a million cases, <laughs> mm. then we're talking something. So it's not what people think. And no, not just because you enjoy drinking wine, should you start a wine company? Doesn't work like that. There's, there's so much more and there's so many moving parts that you might be like, that's okay. <laughs> but I love it. I love it. <laughs> what about you, Rebecca? Like, I, I mean, <laughs> we're both in the history field. So like, yeah. I feel like, I, I understand a little bit, but for the audience and stuff, what, what is it about studying history, especially studying pirates, I yeah. think is, is the thing. Oh, what do you think people get wrong or, or misunderstand? I think that, and I did run into this a bit in my PhD, and I'm kind of curious to know if you did as well, is that a lot of people, they find out I did pirates, they go, I wish I picked a fun subject. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, <laughs> they're like, like, oh, you get to travel to all the fun places for research. And it's like, yeah, well, it's still research. People said the exact same thing to me as well. And I was like, yes, I did go to Jamaica, but I spent the whole time in a library in Kingston. Um, I did manage to take a weekend to go to Ocho Rios and see a little, but for the most part, I'm in the archive uh, the whole time. But, you know, it was just, I just kind of this misconception. It was just this misconception that it was easy. It was fun. Like, oh, you just sit and you just read all day. And the reality is like, on the one hand, it is so fun researching what I do. But on the other hand, it's a slog so often, you know, um, doing all the reading and all the researching with which I love, but also can hate sometimes depending on how it's going. And, um, uh, also, I don't know if you experienced this as well, but a lot of times when I was going to conferences, you know, piracy, maritime -y stuff felt like a boys club sometimes. Oh, yes. And yeah, like I remember being interrupted at a, I was presenting a paper and an elderly gentleman um, criticized my paper saying that I hadn't spoken about the Royal Navy um, and that I can't be researching piracy if I'm not doing the Royal Navy, but the angle I was taking didn't require the Royal Navy. And yeah. I said, and I was explaining that and he interrupted me and said like, no, you're incorrect. And I was like, hmm. um, so, you know, there, and I was still young and shy and I looking back, I'm like so much good said, but, um, I think also like with the way I do it. And I also think it's similar to you, Jamie, is that I'm not like a traditional academic. I teach part-time at a community college, which keeps my foot in. Um, but a lot of the research I do is very much on my own being a community college, not a research institution. I have to kind of really sort of hustle around to find my sources. Luckily, I was just so anal retentive when I was doing my PhD that I saved everything, even if it didn't feel useful at the time. And that's been a big help, especially during the pandemic. But it's very busy. It's both busy, but also a lot of like times where I'm just like, oh God, I just can't seem to get anything done. And I've got all this time, but at the same time, no time, like fielding emails. And, you know, I do a lot of stuff like going on podcasts and doing interviews and guest talks and it's great but keeping on top of the schedule can be quite tricky and you know it's a lot of self-advocating um and I'm not comfortable with it I'm not going to lie um people are like you gotta advertise this you gotta do this you gotta do that and I'm like oh god it feels so weird to do that even though I know it's true but I think it's just kind of this misconception that people think it's easy and that it's just fun when the reality is when I was doing my doctorate doing my research it's no easier or fun than any other topic and in a way to kind of say like, oh, that's so easy. It's in my opinion, it felt a bit like I was being put down a bit. Like mm -hmm. I was just on the here on a lark. And the reality is it's just as difficult and it's just as labor intensive as anything else, but in a way also is fun. And I know I'm very uh, fortunate and privileged to be able to do what I do. And, yeah. you know, I absolutely, absolutely love it. But even though it's pirates, just as much work as anything else. <laughs> I think all of our jobs are just email all day long. <laughs> it doesn't matter what job you do, yeah. where you do it. You're just doing email all day long. <laughs> yeah. And I also have to kind of field a lot of people who actually on social media will get 
upset with me. And um, again, Jamie, I know you experienced this when you wrote that article about the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And yeah, I, I remember that. <laughs> and I'm sorry to even bring it up, but I have also kind of encountered a lot of sort of abuse online. Like I started doing TikTok actually back in August, which has really kind of increased sort of my presence. I just do a pirate factor to a day, that sort of thing. It's a lot of fun. But I did a video, a silly video that went viral, just simply saying pirates didn't bury treasure and that that wasn't a thing. And I can't tell you how many, I've got hundreds of thousands of comments on it of people being like, you don't know anything. You're wrong. Just because you have a PhD doesn't mean you know anything. Like, you know, she knows nothing, like going on and on and on. Like, you know, you shouldn't be doing what you're doing. Like it, and I get a lot of that. Like whenever I say something that people don't like to hear, you know, people get, because of the internet and the anonymity, people just become downright, I don't know if you can swear or not on here, but like, you know, people just get like, they're just downright assholes sometimes, you know, I get like a lot of unsolicited emails, people being like, do your research. You don't know anything. Here's an article from like the daily mail or something like that, or Wikipedia. And it's like, you know, just fielding a lot of this. And sometimes I wonder, I do wonder if I was a man, would I be getting all this? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. No, I I feel that. that. (laughs) Mm Mm-hmm. So I, I want to encourage the audience, if they have any questions, to uh, to put them in the Q&A, uh, and we can have our guests respond. Um, I can keep asking questions forever. That's what I love to do. So <laughs> uh, if you don't, that's okay, too. But but please, if you do. Um, I, I mean, I, I want to ask Krishan, what's the best place on earth, and why is it Chicago? <laughs> <laughs> I love Chicago. I love Chicago. You know, it's one of those things I, I, I would tell all my friends always talk about. They always say, if you can make it in New York, you can make it anywhere. No, if you can make it in Chicago, you can make it anywhere. Um, we have such a mixture of old school, if you will, thought train of thought process here. But we also have so many cliques and groups of like people that, you know, you have to be accepted, whether it be University of Chicago group, whether it be Kellogg's group, you know, like everybody's a group. Um, and um, it, it's sad in that way, because um, there's a lot of segregation in Chicago. Um, but it is also um, the, if you can break through to those different groups um, and maneuver then you can do any, you can make it anywhere. And I've lived elsewhere. I've lived in New York. Um, I went to FIT there. So I lived in New York. I've lived in Las Vegas. I've lived several places that, oh yeah, Chicago, something else. Um, But at the same time, I'd be ready to leave soon, this weather. Uh, I I don't (laughs) need to be here forever. I definitely don't. I definitely want to move West. Um, But Chicago just has my heart. Uh, It's just an amazing place. And and just, I mean, obviously, you know, we have some of the best restaurants in the country. So just even that and, and really breaking through the wine industry with some of the best chefs in the world. Um, has been something else. And, and I, I love the fact that some think Love Cork is amazing. Some like, you still have a little work to do. Hey, I still got 88 points on my wine. So I, I know <laughs> what I'm doing, but it's been amazing. Uh, and again, if you can make in Chicago, I mean, please, Virginia loves Love Cork. I ship to Virginia all the time. There's other states that take my money. Texas is like, just here, here, take my money, Krishan. But Chicago was rough. That was a hard one to crack. I'm flowing everywhere now, but it took me years too. I gotta say, um, for the first, uh, last weekend, I was actually in Chicago for the very first time in my life and I loved it. I went to go see a comedian called Eliza Schlesinger, who I love, and she was at the Chicago Royal Theater on Friday. Mm-hmm. And when I saw she was going on tour, I was like, I'm gonna go see her in a city I've never been to that everyone's always said I should go to, and that's Chicago. And uh, I loved it. I wish I could have spent more time. It was just a long weekend, like Thursday through Sunday, but God, it was so fun love the vibe it very really chill is. very nice yeah we get really such it. a bad rap and people have no idea how wonderful chicago is it yeah really is people ask me really when i was is. going they're like but it's so dangerous and i was like yeah was, no. i was like every city's dangerous like, every city is dangerous. Like, <laughs> every city no different like honestly and it was fine i loved it it's great here <laughs> Well, thinking about, um, you know, how difficult it is to break into these different industries, especially depending on who you are, especially in industries that are dominated by certain demographics, what advice would you give to somebody who wants to get into your industry? Um, Like, especially, Krishan, 
what advice would you give to individuals who are like, I want to get into wine, but I don't see myself there. How can they get past that? Education. Don't do it the way I did it. I did grassroots. Um, I came up during a time that allowed me to um, and really hitting the ground running pre-COVID um, where we were really just still salesmen, like going from, you know, restaurant to restaurant. So there were a lot more in-person um, situations. So a lot more grassroots of getting to know the industry and, and me talking to the winemakers and really getting to know. Nowadays, let's fast forward to not only so many opportunities for minorities, but so many opportunities for women um, to have grants that I never had, never had the opportunity to have from taking the, the WSET courses that used to be way more expensive than they are now, but you can do them and get paid back for them. You can do them online. No, I would have to fly to Napa to do the Napa Academy, but no, you can just do it online for one week and take the course. Um, I mean, take the test. So there's so many other ways and organizations that are helping get into certain industries that you would never think of. And furthermore, there's so many grants and, and um, amazing, I, I'm not one to, to love alone, but there's amazing opportunities of great money that you would never get at interest rates that, that they have out now. Um, so as far as someone trying to start their career um, or start a wine company or wherever, whatever sector you want to get into it, it's the power of, I'm a sound old, the Google. Literally look it up. <laughs> there's so much free money. Seriously. I just won a Tory Birch grant. Um, my company won $20,000 and, and it was simply telling my story um, and telling them at what point I was into my business and scaling in the business. But there's so much money out there for new businesses. There's grants I, I can't get because I'm too far along in my business. They want startup. They want startup. They don't want Love Corks. I'm not startup. So um, I think there's just, I just, just use, use your, your resources and being at home is not a bad thing. Get more educated and make your decision because again, it's not as sexy as it looks. And you're going to find that out taking some of the courses. You're going to be like, oh, it's a little more complicated about how you make wine. It's not just some grape juice and, you know, some carbon dioxide. Like there's a lot going on here. <laughs> so so um, I think just education. Education is the best way right now for free, for free. What about you, Rebecca? Would you encourage people to go into history? And if so, you know, what, <laughs> ha, what, what would you encourage them to think about as they get started? So yeah, people ask me that sometimes, like, you know, would you, after doing a PhD, would you recommend people do it? And I will never discourage someone from doing what they want to do, but I would do caution people. Um, if you want to go into history, try not to go into debt, or if you have to go into debt, make it as minimal as possible, because this is not one of those careers where you're going to be able to make it back very easily, if at all. So that's kind of my big thing. And I would also say, um, like, I can say some things that I did that I'm really glad I did. And also things I didn't do that I know I should have done is um, I tell people, when people ask if they want to study history, I'm like, you definitely got to do something that you're really passionate about. You cannot research a subject that you think will impress somebody. Um, and I would tell this to my students, I could always tell when they wrote an essay on a subject that they weren't super into, but thought I would be impressed by. And I would tell them, I'm like, I don't care what you write about. I want to know you enjoyed it. And so that's, uh, that's why I tell people, I'm like, if you don't like your subject, you will fail because you have to um, enjoy it, regardless what it is. Um, you're gonna feel a lot of imposter syndrome. There are gonna be a lot of times where you feel like you don't belong in your grad program, that they're gonna kick you out, or that it was a mistake. I thought this all the time, especially when I moved to the UK and I was surrounded by people who'd gone to Oxford. Um, and you know, people talk the talk so well, but you belong there just as much as anybody else, and you deserve to be there just as much as anybody else. And if you're going to do a PhD or honestly, if you're going to do any sort of graduate level of history, you've got to, like people say this all the time, but I emphasize it, you've got to find something outside of it to really do, um, take your mind off of it. So um, for example, when I did my doctorate, I got a job with a tour company called Brit Movie Tours. And I did walking tours and I was a tour guide on bus tours for Harry Potter filming locations, Sherlock Holmes filming locations, um, you know, a rom-com tour, which is basically the, um, the guy who directed Love Actually, that director, I can't remember his name all, all, all of a sudden, but um, those movies, and it was great, got me outside, walking around, exercising, talking to people from all over the world, and no matter how stressed I was, it was a godsend. Have 
a really good support system. Um, you got to really think about that. Uh, I was lucky to make really good friends within my PhD. Sometimes I love them so much. Sometimes it did become a little bit of misery loves company a bit too much. So make sure you have friends outside of it who can ground you. Um, and I was lucky to do that. Like meetup.com is what really helped because I didn't know a single person when I moved to the UK. Um, that's a whole other story. Um, and if you can get involved in your department as well as you can. And a lot of people when they're applying to PhD programs, at least in the States, they're trying to think like, okay, if, like Harvard or bust, something like that. The reality is any school you're going to go to, you, it's got, just got to be the right fit for you. Take into consideration, not just the name brand, but you know, affordability. Do you want to be close to your family and friends or not? Weather, if you're from like, you know, for example, me, I'm a baby from Los Angeles. Um, I don't think I could survive a Chicago winter. So <laughs> I did not apply to North, to Northwestern. The summers are worse. <laughs> I still have heard <laughs> like the humidity and stuff. Like I can't handle that either. I'm such a baby. Like the UK actually was okay. It's milder than you think in London. So I survived Okay, but these things talk about and also um, know that the academic job market is terrible. So get skills outside of that you can market. So I'm fortunate I have a teaching credential um, that I had done before I did my doctorate. So I had a lot of teaching experience, but find opportunities to gain skills and connections outside of traditional academia because it's so difficult right now. Like I think they say getting a tenure track position is like winning the lottery these days. Um, I just applied for a professorship and within 10 days, I got an email saying that my application was rejected, probably an internal hire, let's be real. But, um, so that's what I say, like, do your research, get a support network, get a therapist if you can. You're gonna need it. Even if you don't think you will, you will and get ahead of it. I should have done that when I did my doctorate because I definitely had mental health problems when I was doing it. But, so this is kind of what I recommend. But the big thing is just have fun, you know, try to, you know, just try to enjoy what you do as much as you can. Do it if you love it. Um, like Krishan, you're saying, you know, make your hobby, your make your passion, what you can do. And it's the same thing with history. You do have to hustle. You really have to advocate for yourself. But if you do it, it's going to be worth it in the end. Like, yeah, so long winded, I know, but that's my advice to people. So I think we have a couple of audience questions and then we'll kind of wrap up tonight. Um, so Michael asks, uh, he's still a little unclear, Krishan, about how you make the wine. Like where are the barrels? How does that process work? So it's a lot of traveling. So what I do as soon as harvest happens, so years ago I decided to pick certain grapes that I would utilize. So I source grapes. Um, from certain vineyards. I picked that years ago, um, exactly what I wanted, um, exactly what region I wanted, exactly who I wanted to work with. So the process is as simple as at harvest, I'm out there with them, I go, um, and I actually decide what, from, from each sector of winemaking, I decide what I want. So how it's aged, my Cabernet Sauvignon is aged 12 months in oak chips. I decided that. Um, whether it be my Riesling, um, I usually control the acidity a little bit. And it's interesting in Illinois, when you're growing in Michigan, when you're growing Riesling, um, it can become very acidic and I have to control it and not make it too sweet. So I decided to do 4.13% residual sugar. So I'm doing sugar trials. Um, and actually, um, I'm very, very lucky, one of the only, very, very lucky that my uh, vineyards that I work with actually house my wine there. So all of them are, whether it's steel bar barrels, whether it's oak, whatever it is, they are housed in these specific facilities um, because I've done so well um, within those particular vineyards that I can own some of their, I can rent some of their space. Um, so it's Love Corkscrew that they have in the tank waiting for me. Um, and it's, again, I've been working with uh, Michigan Vineyard for going on 10 years now. Uh, the California Vineyard I've worked for seven years now in the Summerlin area. Um, and I uh, just started working with uh, the winery in Chile. Um, and I'm starting to work with one in Washington as well. So it's a process that's gonna take a long time. Um, a lot of times people start in the industry using shiners. Um, I did not have to do that. Um, I went straight to Custom Crush. 
Um, and uh, that, that's just the short of it. I, I can go on and on. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's not easy, but um, I was lucky to develop amazing relationships. Um, a lot of people get it confused, negociants, they get that confused with, I'm having a wedding and I want my name on the label. No, <laughs> <laughs> that's not the same thing. <laughs> it's not the same thing. Um, if you really want to get technical, I'm considered a negociant of voir. So I'm really more hands-on with the product product um, than anything. Um, I will um, be a vintner, if you will, um, when I work with Chile, uh, but not yet. Not yet. I'm working to get there. I'm working to get to that. It takes time. It takes time. Hope that answers the question. And uh, Terry Pollack, aka my mom, wants to, you to go to Ohio, Stark County, Ohio specifically, and do wine tastings there. <laughs> I promise I will soon because Myers is taking Love Corkscrew to another level. Um, the head buyer there just took in two more of my varietals coming in um, starting in uh, January. And we're going to focus um, not only on Black History Month, but Valentine's Day because I have mm. a reason called Head Over Heels. <laughs> and then on to Women's History Month. So um, three whole months of them featuring Love Corkscrew. So trust, I will be traveling to Ohio, um, definitely Michigan as you may know Myers is huge in Michigan um, but I'm going to be going to Ohio and Indiana as well so yes I promise um, I will do some things Fo tell mama to follow me on social media on love corkscrew <laughs> follow me on Instagram and Facebook and I promise you'll see when I'm coming to Ohio <laughs> awesome all right. Well, um, this has been amazing. I, yes. I've learned so much from you guys. Uh, I totally enjoyed my evening. Um, so I think the final question that we always ask is what is one thing you would recommend to the audience, whether that's a book, a movie, a particular drink or a cocktail, an album, like what is something that, you know, you really enjoy that you think others would enjoy as well? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> I'm like running down a big list in my mind. I'm going to be really quick with it. Um, learn to disconnect. Um, and, and I think we all have problems doing that, especially in the times we live in, in whatever you're going through, whether it's starting to work from home more now and we're not used to that and being out, um, whether it's being with the children more, whatever it is, learn to disconnect, even if it's just for like 20 minutes. Trust me, it will build so much energy mentally, physically. Um, and lastly, please, please, please appreciate everyone you have. I lost family to COVID. Um, I, I've been through a lot as a Chicagoan and trust that every second counts. So please take care of yourself so you can take care of others. And I would say something kind of similar to what Krishan was saying in terms of disconnecting. And um, I would say definitely travel as much as you can. And even if it's local, I think a lot of people, I mean, I get in this way too, think like, oh, if you travel, you have to go far. You don't just like, you know, take like a day trip, take a drive, just get a change of scenery. Cause I find, especially over the past like two years, let's be real. It's just helps clear your head quite a bit. And um, you're seeing a new place, a different place. It's like you're being reborn again in a way. So if you're able to just take a day and even drive somewhere, stay overnight or just even for the day, absolutely do it. Um, and just try to just disconnect. And I would also encourage people do it solo if you can and be good with your company because you know, kind of you learn a lot about yourself and you can do whatever you want when you want. I travel solo a bit and I actually really enjoy doing it. I meet really cool people and, um, you know, just being okay with your own company. And this goes anywhere, whether it's been a big trip or if it's just been like, you know, somewhere pretty local. So that's something I always recommend to do. All right. I'll tell my husband, he and the kids can stay here and I'm going on a trip by myself. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck with that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> what about you, Kelly? Uh, well, I, it's hard to follow those with a, you know, a, a, a thing, but 
nonetheless, I am reading a book that I'm really enjoying and that I'm going to recommend. Uh, I read a lot of history. This is not history. Uh, it's by Mary Roach. Uh, she's a science writer, has written just oh, some yeah, fantastic yeah. books that I love. Her newest one is called Fuzz, When Nature Breaks the Law. And it's all about like when a bear kills somebody or, you know, an elephant is stealing crops or, you know, like how they go investigate that and what that looks like. And it's funny, just like all of her books are. So it's, it's a really fun read. Well, I am also you, going Jane? to recommend a book. Uh, well, a book series, I guess. Um, so one of my favorite authors who's still around, thank goodness, is Patricia Cornwell. Uh, I love murder mysteries. I grew up reading Sidney Sheldon, uh, his mystery books, and uh, Patricia Cornwell really stands out to me. And so her case for PETA series uh, follows a um, basically a, a coroner, or a, you know, and she goes. She's in Virginia. She's in D.C. Uh, she goes to Florida, like, and you really get immersed in her world, um, which is a lot of. I mean, it's a lot of fun. It's death. <laughs> but it's still fun. Um, it's very intriguing stuff. So yeah. I'd love to be able to recommend a book as well, um, since just with some book recommendations. So um, one of my favorite authors of all time, who's also still here, thank God, is um, a writer named Juliette Merlier. And she writes historical fantasy, um, very much delving into a lot of Irish mythology and kind of researching a lot about like medieval Irish history and kind of making sort of fantasy stories but based on the mythology and she's a brilliant world building um, and she also has them take place like in Ireland during specific historical time periods like when Christianity is trying to take over Druidism and that, that conflict um, but she's probably one of the most beautiful writers that I've ever read I read that um, she is a musician and so like knowing like musical notation and beats like she reads aloud every sentence until it has a good rhythm to it and you can tell in the writing so the first book is Daughter of the Forest um, that's the book that kind of got her known and I just recommend it to anyone it's just beautiful and it just really kind of takes you away and I'm always looking forward to whatever she writes even if the even if she writes a book that isn't as good as the others it's still really good so all right. Well, with that, uh, I think we will wish everyone a, a fantastic evening. I am going to go finally eat my dinner and drink some more of my Love Corkscrew. Uh, look for it on shelves near you. <laughs> and uh, thank you both so much. This was wonderful. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Thank Thanks, you. Thank you.